Thank you again for coming out. So my lecture today will be on the microbial communities of the Indian River Lagoon and how they change due to natural and human impacts. I'm also going to talk about how I'm hoping to use microbial communities in environmental health. So first, a little bit about my background. I got my Bachelor's of Science at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign in molecular and cellular biology. Uh, then I spent a little over two years in med school at the Stritch School of Medicine as a part of the uh, Navy Health Profession Scholarship Program. I withdrew after a little over two years so I could pursue a career in research. The Navy didn't have anything for me at that time, so I was honorably discharged. And now I'm a PhD student at Harbor Branch. I'm currently in my second year of the five-year program. And when I graduate, I hope to rejoin the Navy as a microbial researcher. My studies are focused on the Indian River Lagoon. And most of you know all, a lot about it, but just a little bit of a review. It's 156 miles long, and it spans about five counties. It has five inlets from the Atlantic Ocean and many tributaries, one of the main ones being the St. Lucie estuary down here. And that means that it is a brackish water environment, so it has a salinity that's between ocean and fresh water. It has three main lagoons, the Mosquito Lagoon, the Banana River, and then the IRL. So it's considered an estuary of national significance. And that's because its annual economic value has been valued at $3.7 billion. And this was a study in 2008. So I imagine the number has increased a lot since then. And this is mostly because of commercial and recreational activities, boating, fishing, things like that. It's also considered one of the most biodiverse estuaries in North America. And one of the main reasons for that is because it's actually found at the border between temperate and subtropical climates. And that allows it to be a spawning and, fish and nursery ground for a lot of fishes. It's also found along the Atlantic Flyway. So a lot of, a lot of birds make their way here during the winter, including snowbirds. <laughs> <laughs> about 2,100 plant species and about 2,200 animal species bound here. But little is known about its microbial communities. In fact, the only paper that even really mentions it basically just said someone should take a look into this. So about 20 some years later, I'm taking a look. But first, I'll give you a little bit of a background on microbes. This is the phylogenetic tree of life. And all this is is kind of a graphical representation of how related different organisms are. If they're close to each other on the tree, it means that their DNA, or the building block of, their, of what they are, is very close to each other. We're here in the animal section. And we're pretty closely related to fungi and plants and we're also eukaryotes. My studies are focused on everything here. Bacteria, which is generally what you know as germs, but they do a lot more than just act as pathogens, and archaea. Archaea are extremophiles in that they're actually found in locations that either have high temperature, high salinity, like the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. So, Bacteria and archaea have been around for a very long time. Fossils date back to 3.5 billion years ago. And life as we know it wouldn't be here without them. The prevailing theory is that back in the day, they were responsible for a lot of photosynthesis. And photosynthesis just takes water and CO2 and creates oxygen. So it created the atmosphere and had a lot more oxygen in it because of these microbes. We also wouldn't be able to digest our food without them. Acid only takes care of so much. Bacteria can break down things such as cellulose. And the same thing happens for plant growth. They're found around their roots and help break down nutrients for them. So on your hand, there's more microbes there than there are people on the planet. In one gram of soil, there's 100 million bacteria and about 10,000 fungi. And in one drop of seawater, or one milliliter, there's about 10 million viruses and about one million bacteria. So they are everywhere, and they're here in high numbers. They also serve many important functions. One of their main functions is cycling nutrients. They cycle nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and sulfur. So what they do is they change the form of these various elements into something that can actually be used by organisms. They can also change the chemical form of various pollutants, including mercury. It's actually a byproduct of one of their main processes. For aerobic respiration, they use oxygen, but eventually oxygen is depleted in an environment. 
and it goes down to using different chemicals until it gets to sulfate. And once it starts using sulfate, one of the byproducts is methylating mercury, which allows it to bioaccumulate through the trophic food chain. And it also creates hydrogen sulfide, which is that rotten egg smell you sometimes smell in certain areas of the lagoon. We'll get into that. They're also the source of many natural products. One of the main ones is penicillin. It was found in a fungi. And it's also, they also serve as the foundation of the food web. We already talked about how they are eaten by the organisms above them. But they're also responsible for organic degradation. So they take things like leaves and they break them down into something that can be used by higher organisms. So this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but this is kind of an overview of what microbiome studies are. And we'll break it up a little bit. This middle section is just how I, how I actually analyze the, the, the microbial communities. Microbial communities are found everywhere, as we discussed. There's a couple of different microbiomes on your body. There's a skin, gut, et cetera. So what I do is I take these communities and I extract their DNA. DNA is just the building block of life. DNA is eventually transcribed into RNA, so it can go outside of the nucleus, and then it's made into proteins and metabolites. These are the things that are actually in your body that perform the various functions. Okay? Now, now moving on to taxonomy, or who's there. There's different, troph there's different taxonomic classifications. We already talked about the kingdom, which is the bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, but also six other classifications. There's phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. We are homo sapiens, and that's homo sapiens, okay? And then my other main focus of my study is the ecology, or how they interact with each other and how they interact with the environment. One of the main things I look at is alpha diversity. This is the diversity within a sample. I also look at beta diversity, which is the, the diversity between samples. And I look at various environmental variables to see how the microbial communities change in response to these changes in the environment. There's also function, or what are they doing? The function is kind of a higher level of analysis than what I'm currently doing right now, so we're only gonna focus on the taxonomy or who's there throughout this presentation. Microbial communities change in response to natural and anthropogenic, which is human disturbances. These can be very multifactorial, meaning that they all interact and that some of these factors can have a higher influence than others. And there's several different ways that the microbial community can react to these changes. They can resist it, meaning that there is no change in the, in the microbiome. They can be resilient, meaning that they change, but they convert back to where they used to be. They can have functional redundancy, which means that the actual members of the community change, but the overall ability of the community does not. They have the same functions, they just have different species. And then they can actually alter their function. And this can lead to different changes in the ecosystem services that we already discussed. Their ability to cycle nutrients, their ability to change the chemical form of pollutants. So for example, if heavy metals are introduced into an environment, certain members of the community are able to handle that better than others. So their numbers will increase whereas the, because they have resistance mechanisms and then the other members of the community will have their numbers decrease, okay? So one of the ways people have been trying to use microbiome data lately is to use it in environmental health. And one of the ways they're trying to do this is by community-based indicators, or CBIs. These are members of the community whose abundance is highly associated with some environmental variable. So microbes can be good indicators of environmental health because they have a greater sensitivity to a lower level of contaminants, meaning you'll see changes at a microbial scale before anything happens at a macro scale, before anything happens to any other animals in the area. That's because they respond quicker to changes in the environment. You also have greater resolution because you're actually looking at an actual community with thousands of different species, each with their own unique abilities and contributions to the environment. You can also test for the biological impact of multiple pollutants at once, since they're all able to do different things and they also respond differently to trace metals, to nutrients, and things like that. To this end, I've designed my dissertation around three main projects. We'll only talk about two here. The first one is an IRL-wide survey, and this is to determine what the baseline microbiome of the IRL is. As I said, there is no published data 
regarding microbiome of the Indian River Lagoon. So I'm providing the first real in-depth look at it. And I'm a, most concerned about how they change due to natural impacts such as salinity and rainfall and how they change due to human impacts. I'm focused in on muck, trace metals, and Lake Okeechobee discharges. This will be conducted over two years so I can see how the communities change seasonally and how they change annually. Because when you look in the Indian River Lagoon, you need to make sure your studies are at least two years long. Because one year can be significantly different from another year. I'm also going to be able to establish my community-based indicators for various pollutants. I'm going to focus in on muck, trace metals, and salinity. Because salinity is a good way of looking at things such as nutrients, because they're highly associated with nutrients due to discharges from like Lake Okeechobee and things like that. So this is a 15 site survey along a 100 mile stretch of the lagoon. 11 of these are located next to continuous water quality monitoring stations. Nine of these are Lobos from, the, from Harbor Branch, which is land, ocean, biogeographical observatories. And two of them are also from uh, the St. John's Water Management. I could use them from ORCA, uh, and that's something I was gonna explore in the future. I also have two known muck sites and two sites that are kind of control sites in that they're more pristine in Jupiter Narrows and Hope Sound now National Wildlife Refuge. So my second study is focused in on the O'Galley River up here near Melbourne. And that's because they're actually dredging muck up there. Vero Beach site up here is actually located next to one of the canals. And the Lobos were actually put at these various locations. So Lobos are at the Sebastian Inlet, Vero Beach, uh, Link Port right here, which is Harbor Branch, Fort Pierce, and then all of these are also Lobos. They were put at these locations because of the ecological variables that are there. But yes, one, one of the main ones in terms of other freshwater discharges is Vero Beach. It's located next, to, fairly close to the main canal. So muck is known locally as black mayonnaise. It has three main characteristics associated with it. It has at least 75% water, and its solid fraction has at least 60% fine grains and 10% organic matter. And it, has, it is formed from the bacterial degradation of organic matter found in runoff. And it had, sorry? Found in what? Found in runoff. So, um, Water, water discharges and things like that. If somebody's mowing their lawn and the grass clippings make it into the lagoon, then it eventually turns into muck. Um, they're also associated with increased nutrients and turbidity and are highly associated with contaminants since contaminants like to bind to finer grain sediments. Dredging has been shown in the past to actually remove muck and its associated contaminants, but it also has problems itself. It can lead to turbidity and siltation. Siltation is just the movement of fine grain sediment downstream or in the lagoon downwind, since this is mostly a wind influenced location. Studies have shown that microbial communities do change in response to dredging, but this provided this used an outdated technique and I'm going to provide an updated look at it. In terms of my actual dredging project, I'm trying to determine how the microbial communities and various environmental variables change in response to dredging. I actually took Two, sam two sampling events, a wet season and a dry season before dredging started. And dredging just started in January. Uh, I have five sites. Three of them are located within the dredging area, which is this section here. The East River and the, or the East River and the West River will actually be dredged, and the central location will not be dredged because it's too close to a bridge. And then I have two locations out here in the IRL to kind of act as dredging negative controls. These areas will not be dredged at all. These sites out here are actually main part of one of my secondary objectives. I want to see if these sites actually change due to dredging. We already talked about siltation. And the IRL is interesting in that during the wet season, when there's a lot more water mass moving the sediment, the wind actually goes towards the north. And during the, south, or during the dry season, it actually goes towards the south. But there's also less water movement happening because there's less rain and the dredging has actually shut down for two months during the dry season to take into account the manatee mating season. Uh, so I'm expecting to actually see a greater influence 
on the northern site than the southern site when dredging actually occurs. So it'll be interesting to see if that actually happens. I also want to determine what the source of the new microbial communities are. Since you're removing the muck, you're also removing the associated microbes. So I'm testing the water above these samples and obviously the IRL sites. And I kind of expect the new community to be a combination of those two, uh, of those two communities. It also allowed me to test the muck associated community based indicators that I find in the lagoon wide survey. So now we'll talk a little bit about my protocol. I go out there and I take sediment samples using an Ekman grab. And all this is, is just, it it's, goes down to the sediment. I drop down a messenger and it closes in on the sediment and I'm able to bring it up. And I also take sediment temperature. With the water samples, I just take uh, bottles that have been sterilized and just take the surface water sediment, surface water samples. I'm also taking various environmental variables, temperature, salinity, nutrients with the Lobos and the St. John's stations. And then if none of those are nearby, I'll check to see if Orca has one nearby, but also do uh, YSI, which also gives me temperature, salinity, and pH. I also determined the depth using PVC pipe that had been labeled with various tenth of a meter lengths. And I push it in, and when I first feel any resistance, that's where the top of the sediment is. And then I, if I can, I continue pushing down until I feel another plane of resistance. And that difference between the planes of resistance is the muck depth. At the Harbor Branch Channel, which is actually my deepest site, 12 feet, I, I kind of actually ran out of PVC pipe. So I had to continue pushing down and had them measure down to, up to my elbow because the muck is so thick there. I, so I added a fourth one somewhat for my next sampling event. So in terms of my actual molecular biology protocol, I'm taking triplicate sediment and triplicate water samples and I extract DNA. And this leaves a sample that has all the DNA from those samples. But I'm only concerned about the bacteria and the archaea. So I send it off to research and testing for polymerase chain reaction of a 16S rRNA gene. And all this is, is a gene that's highly conserved and only found in bacteria and archaea. And PCR is just a way to amplify that region so that, I get a, so that they can get a bunch of amplicons, okay? And then they take these amplicons and they perform next generation sequencing, which means that they've just defined the nucleotide sequence nucleotide sequence associated with each of these amplicons. Then they send the data back to me where I perform sequence analysis. And one of the things I do is I assign each of these, to each of these sequences an actual taxonomic identification string. This is known as an operational taxonomic unit. So it basically just defines the taxonomy levels that we talked about earlier, the kingdom, the family, everything like that. I also perform quality filtering. So one of the Complications associated with 16S is that there actually is a portion of our cell that does have 16S. It's called mitochondria. It's the powerhouse of the cell and it creates all the energy. Plants also have something similar and they have chloroplasts. This also has 16S and it has the chlorophyll, which allows it to perform photosynthesis. So I quality filter out any sequences associated with mitochondria and with chloroplasts and also get rid of the unassigned sequences because there's nothing I can do with those. And I have, at this point, I've had three main sampling events. I've had the wet season of the lagoon-wide survey and the wet and dry seasons of the pre-dredging surveys. So I have 138 total samples. This led to 5 million sequences that I assigned to 333,000 operational taxonomic units. It took over 24 hours for my computer to actually process this data. I kept checking for smoke. <laughs> in terms of the actual sediment characteristics, characteristics that I take care of when I get back to the lab, first thing I do is determine water content by oven drying. So I take the weight of a sample before and after drying, and that percent difference is the amount of water in the sample. From also from the wet sediment, I perform wet sieving. So I pour a sample through two sieves in order to separate them into the gravel, sand, and fine fractions. For the sediment that I've dried, I also determine the loss of ignition in order to determine the total organic matter. 
And this is similar to the oven drying in that I take the weight before and after it's put into a muffle furnace, which goes to 550 degrees Celsius. And that every, the weight that's lost is the organic matter. And these are the three sediment characteristics associated with muck. So now we're moving on to the actual data portion of my lecture. This is a visual representation of those muck characteristics I mentioned earlier. Water content is in blue, percent fines is in gray, and total organic matter is in brown. So a site is considered muck if it actually exceeds each of these three thresholds. So once again, we have to have at least 75% water, 60% fine grains, and 10% organic matter. So I have four of these associated with my lagoon-wide survey. One is the Harbor Branch Channel, which used to be a ship channel for uh, those gigantic ships they used to take out with the subs. So it made sense that it was mucky. One is Manti Pocket, which is located down by the St. Lucie Estuary. One is Melbourne Causeway up north, and another is South Fork, another location in the St. Lucie Estuary. I also have a second designation for sites that only exceeded two of these characteristics in Mucky, and I have one of those in the Middle Estuary, which is also located in the St. Lucie Estuary. This is a principal coordinates analysis, and it looks complicated, but I'm gonna walk you through it. And all this is, is a visual representation of the differences between sites based upon their microbial communities. So if sites are actually closer to each other, or if they group together, it means that their microbial communities are fairly similar. And if they're farther apart, it means that there are dis they are dissimilar. And just to orient you, this axis, when it says 29%, it means that there would be a 29% difference between a site found here and a site found here. Okay, the same thing here with the axes too, except it's an 11.9 difference between a site that would be found here and be found here. Okay, so we actually get some pretty cool results. These are the four sites that are in the St. Lucie Estuary. So there is some grouping based upon location. These are also my freshwater locations. But physical location doesn't explain everything. Since one of the closest sites to my northernmost site in Merritt Island Causeway is the Harbor Branch Channel, which is located 60 miles away. But their communities are fairly similar. Focusing in on the muck sites in black and the mucky site in red, we see that they do not actually cluster together. This shows that the microbial communities associated with these sites, associated with muck, are actually highly diverse. And, but I do see some tight grouping of five sites around my two control sites in Jupiter Narrows and Hope Sound. But physical location, once again, doesn't explain everything. Since my southernmost site, the Hope Sound National Wildlife Refuge, one of the closest sites to it is Sebastian Inlet, which is also located 60 miles away. In terms of the actual diversity or the alpha diversity within a sample, my most diverse site was Manti Pocket at 9.06. My least diverse site was Melbourne Causeway at 8.35. These numbers are actually higher than anything I've really seen in the literature. So once again, confirming the IRL is one of the most biodiverse estuaries in North America. And it also confirms that being a muck site doesn't necessarily mean you have a high or low diversity. Both of these sites are muck. So it, I was actually expo expecting a different result, but it's still cool to be proven wrong sometimes in science. So switching to the pre-dredging surveys, of which I have a dry and wet sampling seasons of. As you can see, there actually is a general increase in muck characteristics between the wet and dry season with the dry season having the higher muck characteristics. This is likely because there's less water moving around the sediment and the organic matter. This had such an effect that the Central Galley River and the South RL sites actually exceeded the organic matter threshold in the dry season. So in, the, in my dredging survey, I have one muck site at the East, River, East O'Galley River and one mucky site in the West O'Galley River. Okay, and this is just a PCOA of the dredging, lo dredging locations. We actually do see some clustering based upon season. Interestingly, the dry season has a much tighter clustering than the wet season. I'm going to have to look into the environmental variables to really tease out why that is and do some 
complicated stats. We also see some clustering based upon location and salinity. So these sites are the O'Galley River. They are the lower salinity sites as well. And these sites are the, in the Indian River Lagoon. And these axes numbers are fairly similar to what we saw in the lagoon-wide survey. And focusing in on the muck and mucky sites, we see that, that once again, they do not actually really cluster together. Now we're going to switch to my community-based indicators. This is based upon the principles presented in two recent studies. The first one determined community-based indicators using ratios and core microbiomes. They compared water and fecal samples. They took water samples from around Santa Barbara, California. Some of these locations were located next to uh, septic outfalls and things like that. They were able to, able to determine by comparing the water and fecal samples that there was four classes that actually had significant changes between water samples and fecal samples. So they decided to create a ratio. There was three classes that increased into, in, when going from water to fecal and then one class that decreased. And they tested that out and determined it was actually a pretty good predictor of fecal contamination in their water samples. It actually correlated well with the techniques that we are currently using to determine fecal contamination, which is looking at the fecal indicator bacteria, such as the enterococci and E. coli. We also determined that there's core microbiome that's only associated with fecal samples. These are particular members of the community who are only found in their fecal samples. So the other study that I kind of based my procedure off of compared coral communities out in the Mediterranean. They had six sites. Two of them were in, unimpacted, two of them were impacted by residential areas, and two of them were impacted by industrial areas. And what they used was a statistical program, which I'll go into detail in a bit, to determine what combinations of coral species and impacts and which actual members of the community are highly associated with those combinations. They found that there was, for instance, they found there was 18 operational taxonomic units that were highly associated with corals in, 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 that were impacted by residential areas. So it's a good, it could be a good predictor of impact from humans. My procedure can be used at any taxonomic level, but I'm only going to talk about my family results here because it's as comfortable as I'm willing to go down in the taxonomic identification with my current statistical power. I want to have more sites before I go lower into the actual taxonomic classification because then you get more community-based indicators. And I want to actually have a good amount of sites to define those. So I'm using indicate species as a screening technique. And to use this, I need to split my sites into groups. And it'll calculate an association value of a particular family for each group based upon its sensitivity and specificity. So to this end, I split my sites into the five muck slash mucky sites and the 10 non-muck sites. After running indicate species, I found there are 26 families that are highly associated with muck. To standardize this, I determined what my core microbiome was across all my samples and found that there were 61 out of the possible 1,654 families that were in all of my sediment samples. So I now combine these to create my own ratio. These are the muck community-based indicators over the core microbiome. So those 26 families are up here, and those 61 families in the core are down here. This is a graphical representation of that ratio. So the higher the ratio, the more muck associated sites should be. And that's exactly what we see. Five of the top six ratios are the muck and mucky sites that we identified earlier. South Fork 2 is an interesting site. It actually had some muck depth as determined by my PVC pipe, but didn't actually exceed any of the muck characteristics. This site's actually located right next to the locks they released the Okeechobee discharges. My sampling was during the wet season, so there's a lot of water moving sediment downstream. I'm going to be doing my dry sampling soon, so it'll be inter interesting to see if there's less water moving the sediment downstream, will this site actually be a mucky site? And those seven sites that I mentioned earlier that cluster together, 
the five sites around the two control sites actually have the lowest ratios. So now that I actually established my community-based indicators using the lagoon-wide survey, I can test them at my pre-dredging survey sites. These sites weren't used in, in the calculations to determine what community-based indicators are associated with MUC. And they kind of work. They correctly identified the MUC and MUCI sites as having the highest ratios. And we actually see an increase in the ratio between the wet and dry season, at least in the Ogallee River. This corresponds with the increase in MUC characteristics that we saw in that, in that earlier graph. But in the lagoon, there is a decrease in the muck characteristics between the wet and dry season instead. I do expect this to be ironed out a little bit once I actually add in the dry season sampling of the lagoon-wide survey. But in general, the highest ratios are the, in the muck associated sites. The South Fork 2 also had a uh, interesting site. It's also similar to the Central Galley River site in the pre-dredging surveys in that these sites also had muck depth but didn't actually have any muck characteristics besides the dry season where it did actually exceed the organic matter threshold. Now we're going to switch a little bit to my actual water samples. These samples are only from 11 sites in the lagoon-wide survey because I only took water samples where I knew I had those continuous water quality monitoring stations because I wanted to have all that, med all that environmental variable data. And we actually see some clustering, once again, of the freshwater sites and the St. Lucie estuary sites off to the side. And this guy all the way down here is the Mirror Island Causeway. I haven't looked too much at the variables yet, but I would imagine that at this time there was a bloom going on in the northern section of the lagoon. This guy is probably all the way down here because it probably has the highest amount of cyanobacteria. Uh, but one of the interesting things here, remember from, our, from the sediment data, this number was down in the 20s. Here, there's a 61% difference between these vertical axes. So the, site, so the actual microbial communities located at the freshwater sites are very, very different from the sites located in the actual proper Indian River Lagoon. And just for clarification's sake, the muck and mucky sites still don't really cluster together. But I wouldn't really expect them to have much of an influence on the water communities anyways. And this is the pre-dredging PCOA of the water samples. I took water samples at all these sites. And though I don't really have a continuous water quality monitoring station there, I do have the YSI data. And the other reason for taking the water community samples there was so I can compare it to the post-dredging communities to see if the water had an influence on the microbes that are there. And we actually do, once again, see clustering based upon season. And similar to the sediment, there's actually tighter clustering during the dry season than in the wet season. And then, though it's not as defined as in the sediment, there is some clustering based upon location and salinity. But once again, the muck and mucky sites don't really cluster together. In summary, from my lagoon-wide survey, we found that I had five muck slash mucky sites and that they clustered based upon location and being non muck sites, at least for the sediment. And for the water, they grouped, they grouped based upon location and salinity. I'll continue this every six months through dry season of 2018. My pre-dredging surveys, we found out that I had two muck slash mucky sites and that they clustered both in the water and sediment based upon location and season. We also found that the muck characteristics increased between the wet and dry season. This will be continued every six months through dry season of 2019, because I actually want to have two samples post-dredging. I was also able to establish and test my community-based indicators from muck. I'll eventually develop ones for trace metals and salinity as well. So big picture, my studies are important because I've been able to now identify what the core, what the actual microbiome of the Indian River Lagoon is and it serves as a baseline for any other studies. 
I'll also be able to determine how this changes over time due to natural and human impacts. My ultimate goal, though, is to come up with a technique that can be used by management agencies and researchers worldwide to determine community-based indicators for pollutants of concern within their systems so that they can actually use microbial communities as indicators of environmental health. And it's a microbial world. We just live in it. Thankfully, I've, had a lot of help. I've been able to do a lot of things with my research already. I've been able to present four posters at some of the local conferences. And recently, I gave an oral presentation at the Indian River Lagoon Symposium. It's similar to the talk I gave here, except a lot shorter. Um, and I actually did receive an astounding student presentation for that talk. I'm also the president and founder of the student, as the student association at Harbor Branch. We didn't have a student association yet. We didn't have any student groups up there yet. So um, I found the need and decided to be the person to fill it. I'm also part of, part of the Omicron Delta Kappa Leadership Honor Society. So I've had a lot of help and been fortunate to get some good funding for this project. I was able to apply for and get the Everglades, for Everglades uh, Scholarship and the Indian River Lagoon Graduate Research Fellowship. Uh, this is actually provided from the gala that's at Harbor Branch. So if any of you actually attended that, thank you very much. Or if you bought any of the license plates specifically to Shark Plate, Thank you very much as well. Um, I'd like to thank, also thank my advisor, Dr. McCarthy, and my committee members, Dr. Dickens, Hansack, Treffrey, and Voss. Dr. Treffrey actually went out there with me for my first sailing event and helped out greatly. I've also been able to receive a lot of help from the McCarthy Lab and Dr. Hansack's lab as well. But uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>